And 2 Peter 1. In case some of you didn't know, uh, Dean Hutchins passed away this past week. So if some of you know Dean, we don't know where the funeral's at, but just let you know that. Okay, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and 2 Peter chapter 1. Okay, Hebrews 11, uh, this is commonly called the Hall of Faith chapter. It's about the faith of people and faithful people. Uh, verse 1, Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report through faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Okay, then Abel is used as an example. Verse 4, Enoch. Verse 5, Noah. Verse 7, Abraham and Sarah. They get 12 verses. That's pretty impressive. And then uh, Jacob gets, uh, you know, one verse. Joseph does. Isaac does. Gets one verse. Uh, Moses gets three. Three or four. Five. Six for Moses, and uh, Rahab gets a verse, and then um, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel. At least they get on the list. That's a good list. Okay, uh, verse six. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Notice the word diligently. That's where I'm going to look at. Diligently seek him. Then 2 Peter chapter 1. The idea there of diligently seeking after God puts the responsibility on us individually. Okay, diligently seek him. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. So when a person... Uh, has faith in Jesus Christ. We're not to stop there. Verse 5, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, godliness, and so forth. Okay, so it is each and every individual's responsibility to diligently seek after God. And when you believe in God, then it is our responsibility to diligently add to your faith, virtue, and all those things. That is our responsibility. Okay, so let's go ahead and pray with that in mind. I ask and pray, Lord, that you'd uh, put a drive within each of our hearts that each and every one of us would diligently uh, seek after God and diligently uh, add to our faith virtue, character, integrity, discipline, uh, godliness, knowledge, and all those things that uh, you've listed there diligently help us to do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so that's the idea this morning, diligence. Uh, diligence means care and conscientiousness in one's work. Okay, diligence. Uh, similar to the word zeal. Uh, but diligence is uh, something that's required. Many will admit, how, how many of us will admit that we were not diligent in our studies in school. I took four years of Spanish class, two junior high, two high school. I remember the first thing I was taught, pelon, pelon, cabeza de melon. And that is uh, baldy, baldy, watermelon head. First thing we were taught, seventh grade Spanish. And uh, uh, that's, I remember, comp don't, no comprendo, uh, si, no, uh, and several other things. Okay, but obviously looking at that, I know I wasn't diligent in my studies. And how many of us uh, recognized we were not diligent and then we had to relearn it? And the relearning, we did it quicker because we were more diligent. Okay, and there are some homeschool methods that some don't, don't even say, don't teach a kid until he wants to learn. I, I think you do have a problem with that, but still, some don't even do anything until they're nine. 
But when the child diligently wants to learn how to read, he catches them by the time he's 12. You know, that's one thing teachers, we, it's kind of uh, discouraging in class, you know, where you're trying to teach away, you're putting your heart and your efforts in, and a kid's like, you know, they're out daydreaming. They're not diligent. They're not diligent in their studies at all. And they're going to have to learn it a second time somewhere along the line. Okay, and the thing is, when, when a person has a personal desire to be diligent in any area of life, you learn it quicker. Okay, most diligent, uh, most people are diligent in certain areas of life, but most people are diligent in areas of life that are really not important, or not counting, or not eternity based. Uh, diligence is rewarded in two ways, once here on earth and twice in heaven. Here on earth, anybody who is diligent in any task usually becomes successful in that task that they're diligent in. Professional athletes do not climb up the professional uh, ladder by being lackadaisical, passive. I don't feel like practicing today, coach, so I don't have to practice. No, diligence is rewarded in any area of life. Uh, it's interesting that uh, in the state schools, the state-sponsored schools, socialism is where socialism is found. Socialism and communism is found. It is, it is spawned and bred in the state education, but yet the state college professors will reward, award students who are diligent in their studies. They don't give C all the way across the board. C for communism. They don't do that. They award diligence. They flunk, or they should flunk, lack of diligence. I mean, that's just, you know, uh, how it goes. They're, socialism is just in a mind, like atheism. It's just in a mind. It's just a thought. It's not, there's nothing practical or real about it. Okay? And, and the socialist schools, if they would stop getting, forcing the funds coming to them, their education would be, okay, but still the idea. Now, if you would, in Luke chapter 15, verse 8, the Bible will help illustrate certain words, uh, and you get these words in English, forget Greek and Hebrew, and so the word diligent, if you find it throughout the Bible, you'll find it multiple cases, uh, and here is a perfect example that we all will understand, Luke 15, 8, is how diligent are we to be in any whatever subject? Okay, and I'm going to give a few that I think are very important to be diligent at. Luke 15, 8, it says, Either what woman having ten pieces of silver. Okay, so if you go ten ounce coins, silver eagles, you're talking about 20, 22 bucks a piece. So this individual's got a bag with ten coins in there worth about anywhere from 220 to 250. Okay, so she hid it in her house, and she couldn't remember. Boy, have I done that before. Okay, so what happens? Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, seeking diligently until, until she find it. Okay, so there's our illustration. How diligent we are to be in any area of these areas of life. As diligent as you are if you lose a coin. I mean, I've cleaned the house down, down at the Rensselaer house once. I was cleaning away down the basement, going this, going that. I found a bag with silver coins in it. I thought, well, wow, look, I forgot, I forgot where I hid those. And then Brent said, hey, that's mine. <laughs> oh, I forgot you hid them. <laughs> Rats. <laughs> but uh, I thought I got an extra little fun there. <laughs> but any of us, if you find something like that, man, you are going to be excited. Proverbs chapter 2 says that we are to study... And seek after wisdom, knowledge, understanding as you seek after silver. A years ago here at the church over here where we had the kids club on Thursday night, it was, I think at that time, was it Awana's? I don't know. It's been in the past. And so I was teaching something for the kids in there. Uh, they were yeah, like nine and ten year old boys. And before I came in class, I taped four quarters under four different chairs. And I was telling them, and I used an illustration. I said, now you boys should study after truth. As much as you would seek after a coin. By the way, 
There are four chairs that have a quarter on them. Of course, it was a sandwich coin quarter, not a silver quarter. But it was a, there's a quarter. And of course, them, kid, them guys went nuts. I mean, it didn't take seconds of shoom, whipped over that chair, get that coin, ripped that thing off, and jumped up and down excited. That's how excited we should be for the words of God. Okay, and that's the illustration of diligence and that. Okay, he's illustrating it that way. How about diligence uh, that people have in electronic games and video games? How about diligence with a cell phone? Man, you go anywhere, you see people with their cell phone walking around. We got them a wrench there. Oh, I'm trying to get the monster out in the gym. You know, I'm playing Pokemon Go. Yeah, you look like a Pokemon Go. I mean, and they're diligent at that. What a waste. What a waste, diligent at those things, you know, and all. If people were as diligent carrying their Bible around, like getting a text message from God, he's got some of the text symbols in here. Don't you see the little semicolons in here? And the and, and that's you know that's a wink. It's in the Bible. You don't put little happy faces in it. My wife's Bible's got pictures in it, but uh, it's there. Uh, that's how we're supposed to be. If you go through the Proverbs, anybody who is diligent in their labor usually gets promoted. Diligence in the free enterprise gets promoted. Diligence in government entities usually get laziness gets promoted. Proverbs 10, verse 4. He, that be, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Proverbs eleven twenty seven, He that diligent, diligently seeketh good procureth favor, but he that seeketh mischief, it shall come upon him. 12, 24, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule. People, don't, people that get elected to political office don't get there by being lazy. They do put forth an effort. Now, granted, they get somebody else to foot the bill most of the time. But still, it says, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Uh, in any area of life, diligence is rewarded in earth. Okay, on earth, people reward diligence by, you know, uh, being uh, a good athlete or whatnot. A whoremonger got awarded last night about $100 million for about a 35, 40-minute fight because he's been diligent. In boxing. Where in the world does a man get awarded a hundred, about a, you know, a million dollars or three million dollars per minute of a fight? But in America. And he's a whoremonger. And when he stands before God, I don't think it's going to count anything. You, you admire his diligence for the sport, for his efforts. But when he's in front of Michael the archangel... And he's going to say, I was 50 and 0. And Michael's going to say, I'm impressed. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't matter. Okay, so I want to give you some areas that I would say requires diligence. The very first time the word diligence is found in the Bible is in Exodus 15, 26. Now this one, I'm going to get to meddling. <laughs> Exodus 15.26, uh, obviously we're not going to look at it doctrinal, okay, because it's Israel. Okay, it's the very first time the word diligence, when I say diligence, diligently, diligent, okay, is found in the Bible. And this is the very first time the word disease is found in the Bible. Same verse, Exodus 15.26. Now God is talking to Israel. Okay, and he said this, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I the Lord am the Lord that healeth thee. So this is the idea of the gift of healing under the Old Testament covenant. But, the idea, we can see it for Israel, is that if you diligently seek the ways of the Lord... 
and do them, do that which is right, then you won't get the diseases of Egypt. The Egyptians had a lot of diseases going on, partly because of what they were eating and everything involved, and partly because of the medical world and that they had in Egypt. And God said, I'm not going to put that on you. So, so the very first occurrence of the word diligence in the Bible is rewarded with good, I'm sorry, good health. Good physical health. Health. Now, the health world, if you study the health world, you go to the average um, health food store, there's a closet in the back. If you look in there, there's probably a broom, and that's probably what she rode in to come to work. Okay? I know the new, the new agey, healthy stuff. It's all new agey. I understand that. They put down the Bible, and they're missing out one of the greatest things for health. Mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, and physical health. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 8, it says, referring to the word of God, it shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. There's one health technique that they can take a nutrition or supplement, put it on your navel, and tell you if your body wants it or not. From your navel. Isn't that how it started, I think? Didn't we get our nutrition from our navel? I mean, sin started because somebody put something in their mouth that they should not have. Okay? And the thing is, is I've got one body, this is it, and I'm responsible for it. And I'm going to pray and ask God to help me to give this body what it needs to have the diseases of Egypt to stay apart from me. The idea, all I'm saying is I'm encouraging study. For yourself. Do your own research. 1 Timothy 4 verse 8 says, Bodily exercise profit a little, but godliness is great gain. So obviously we know the priorities here. Okay? The goal of the AMA is not godly. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Why do people, Christians, blindly follow the ungodly advice of ungodly doctors and maybe some Christian doctors that received ungodly advice. I'm not saying don't listen. To, I'm not saying that. I'm saying don't do what Asa did. Asa in the Old Testament, a good man, a good king, got uh, some severe form of gout in his old age, in his old, upper years. I say old age. I think it was just in his 40s or 50s. Old's not until you're 60 and up. So I've got till November. But I missed a birthday because when Hyde, Jan and I flew to Australia, we missed the 27th on the way to Australia. So I'm back down to 58. Okay, and so, um, but he got a bad gout or something, disease in his feet, it said, which is an acidic body. And it says that he went to the physicians. He did not seek the Lord. If he would have sought the Lord first, maybe the Lord would have said, go to the physicians to help you. But he went to the physicians without praying. And he suffered two years and died. Okay, how about the woman in the New Testament, the lady with the issue of blood? Twelve years, it says, she suffered many things of many physicians. And was nothing better. Okay, I'm not saying don't go to the doctors. I'm saying pray and ask God to guide you. The number three killer in America is wrong medications from doctors. I know my dad would not be here if he hadn't questioned one medication a doctor was telling him to take. And he questioned it, and he goes, oh, okay. And I am, I am thoroughly convinced of that. Okay, I'm, all I'm saying is we need to pray and ask God for guidance what we should put in our body. What we put in this mouth, we need to recognize that our mouth, our appetite might like something, but our body says, hey, that's not good for me. And we need to recognize that the food industry is tricking us with chemicals to get us to eat things that taste good that are poisonous to our body. Do the research. Get on, get on YouTube and look up high fructose corn syrup. 
It is an artificial sweetener from GMO corn. It's a replacement of sugar because it's sweet. It's just cheaper. And if you go to the grocery store, you want to discover a conspiracy. Look at the ingredients. Number one ingredient is the one that's most in the product. Number two is the second most. Thirty to the third most. High, to, high fructose corn syrup. It causes fatty liver. It tricks the body. In the body you have a leptin is a hormone that informs the body I'm full. High fructose corn syrup tricks the brain into thinking I'm still hungry. It's a chemical. And it goes right to the liver, triggers lipogenesis, which is a production of fats, and causes a fatty liver. I mean, just do your research. That's the research I've done. It was real quick. Figured it out. When you go to the store, look at all the ingredients. Wow. If you don't understand the words of the ingredients, I would suggest don't buy it. Because it's, it's, it's words that we don't understand, and it's there for a reason. Okay, Why? Ungodly men are running this food industry and they don't have our best interests at heart. They have money at heart. Okay, I'm just saying this is some things I've learned. Do something to get your body in a more alkaline pH, a higher pH and alkaline. Because acidic body is where cancer thrives. And so we try to get our body in a more alkaline and we learn from these things. I'm not saying being a vegetarian, I'm not saying that. But you know, meat is bland without spice, vegetable, garlic, vegetable, onions. I mean, what? Ketchup. Ketchup with high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> Mustard, horseradish. Man, I get your nose going. But it, I'm just, I'm not saying be that. I'm just saying we need to pray. And think long term. Think something that helps me out. Uh, you know, uh, buying at convenience stores is probably the worst place to go because you got the lowest amount of product for the highest amount of cost. And it's just that we didn't plan ahead. I mean, I rarely get anything at convenience stores except gas, uh, liquid gas. Okay, and so <laughs> you get that from, you know, and all that stuff. Why? Because they have the small... You know that if you buy something larger quantity, it's cheaper per volume when it's... And so you got to plan ahead. If I'm going to have something to drink, you know, I, I take it with me. You know, I play basketball down at, you know, down at Rensel Tuck. I don't drink the drinking fountain because I can smell the chlorine and fluoride. I bring my apple cider vinegar in my jar with honey. And the guy said, ooh, what's that? I said, something you don't want, but I'll take it. <laughs> I never have to worry about somebody swigging my pop, my, my uh, pop, my apple cider vinegar. <laughs> That's my pop. Because just look at, look at high fructose corn syrup and what it does. And man, here, we're corn farmers, you know, and um, we make money off corn. But yet I'm not encouraging that. I'm encouraging to study. The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And that is a universal law. If I'm going to sow Twinkies and Ho-Hos and donuts, I'm going to end up looking like it. You know, I mean, that's how it goes. That's just a law of life. All I'm encouraging is be diligent in the body God's given you. Be diligent to take care of that. Jan and I have been studying this for years, and we can help shortcuts to learn some things and and can help a lot of areas. And we just need to be diligent. And of course, we're all going to fail at it. We all got our, you know, I like, I like pop, cheese popcorn late at night, you know. Naughty, naughty me. But uh, when Jen and I started on this health stuff, we would, uh, we would be good for 30 days and then splurge one day. And we would splurge. I mean, Dairy Queen, McDonald's. I, no, no, we didn't, I haven't done McDonald's in years. Uh, I mean, we would do, uh, you know, M&M peanuts. Lisa's got a peanut, not a chocolate. And we start getting sick from our spurge days. So then we started, okay, we got to do something else. Okay, now that's one area to study. The second area. If you would, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9, if you want to take the time to look at that one. 
Uh, Deuteronomy, he has about six times in there where God told Israel, be diligent in what? The words of God. Now there's a priority. That's an eternal priority. Be diligent in your seeking and studying of the words of God. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 9. Okay, uh, another one. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 6. So diligent that when you're just doing something every day with your kids, stop and show them something about the Bible. Dad and I and Brent was out pulling weeds. We were getting the velvet leaf and horse weeds out of a soybean field. And so I uh, came across buttonweed, velvet leaf. That's a counterfeit soybean. Farmers know this. Well, city folks don't. Looks like a soybean, but it's not a soybean. It's counterfeit. And so uh, I yanked one. It happened to be a big one. I yanked one and pulled a soybean plant with it. So I stopped and said, look at this. Look at it, Brent. This is a counterfeit soybean. This counterfeit. Okay, just like NIV. That's an NIV right there. And when people get hooked, the soybean plant get hooked to the NIV and you pull the NIV away, then you pull the personal away. And the best thing to do is get that NIV when it's small, but you've got to take more diligence to find it. And you've got to realize there's counterfeits. Corn has this counterfeit, sorghum is a counterfeit. Looks like corn, but it's not corn. Okay, and things in nature are counterfeits. So God says we need to learn these things. And the thing, we need to be diligent in our Bible study. Now, I know a lot of preachers, you know, they always, about the only verse they know is Hebrews 10, 25, for sake, not to assembling ourselves together. Okay, but, uh, yeah, and I understand that. And I think a person ought to be diligent in, in church attendance. You know, they can. But we also have other ways where you can be diligent in your Bible study on Monday. We've got online things. Uh, you know, somebody puts a lot of my stuff on YouTube. I don't do that. Except for the uh, Bible Man's, uh, Common Man's Bible Institute. I put that on there. No, I didn't. Ken did it for me. Uh, and not just listen to them. Uh, I'm on Final Fight Radio. I was in Australia, and a little boy said, we listen to you on Final Fight Radio. I said, oh, good. I don't. Uh, but I'm glad you do. <laughs> but it's a it's an online internet radio station out of uh, Washington, Portland, out of Portland, Oregon. John Robertson does that. Robinson. Uh, I mean, you can get you can listen to sermon audio. Listen to Reg Kelly, man, good preacher. Okay, get him on sermon audio. David Peacock's all over there. You don't have to, you know, just get it on Sunday. Be diligent. Listen on Monday. Listen on Tuesday. I mean, the internet can be used for something good. Al Gore didn't plan for that, but he could use for something good. God's going to make his hell not as hot because, you know, he's helping people out with the Bible. (laughs) I'm so thankful for Al Gore. But uh, the thing is, is we need to be diligent. Now, when I was really putting a study, my personal study, it was in cassette tapes. Now, people don't know what that is anymore, cassette tapes. I had so many cassette tapes, I got tapeworm from them. But the idea is I was really wanting to study. And I wanted to see what the Bible says. It was such a blessing to me to be able to never have to add or subtract the word of this book. Oh, is that a blessing to me? I've been looking at for that for years. I went through five years of Christian college and didn't know that. Man, I could save you a bunch of money. Oh, I'm so thankful when God showed that to me. And a lot of times when people go through them four years of college, they don't want to admit that they were wrong. What a blessing to see the dispensations of the Bible. I mean, you see, we see those men in the Bible. What was their attitude towards the words of God? Job said this in Job 23, 12. Neither have I gone back from thy commandments. I have esteemed thy words more than my necessary food. And he didn't even have a Bible. God spoke to him through dreams and visions. David said, seven times a day do I praise thee for thy righteous judgments. I don't do that. Did you praise God seven times yesterday for his words? I didn't do that. You know, I didn't do it on Friday. I was too busy getting shot with paintballs. But, uh, you know, and I think that's pretty interesting. Je- Jeremiah said, I found thy words and did eat them. He said, Jeremiah, what's eating to you? The word of God. 
Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That's pretty fanatical. That's diligent. The new Bible has changed it. Man should not live by bread alone. You've got to put hamburger and tomato and lettuce and everything else on it. <laughs> That's what the new Bibles are going to say. No, actually what they did is they took out the word of God. And so we ought to be diligent in our Bible study. Not only that, diligent in our uh, expounding the word of God. In Acts 18.25, it says that a fellow named Apollos was diligently teaching. Diligently. <clears throat> and that's where we're very precise with the wording of the Bible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Where we are honest and we say, oh, ooh, wow, that, that didn't say what I thought it said. That didn't say what somebody told me it said. I went to and looked at it. <clears throat> what do I do with this verse compared to this one? Wow. And somebody who's diligent will take the time to study it out. Okay, and so that's the second area. The third area. This one will help us out too. Proverbs 4.23, if you would look at that. <clears throat> Proverbs 4.23. And this is something we all have to work on continually. Because of the offenses of men and, and the hurts that we have for others and, and the hurts we deal with life, we can get hardened to things and our heart can get hard. And so Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. How do we want to keep our heart? Keep it tender towards God. Keep a tender heart. In, that, in Hebrews 12, verse 15, it mentions Esau. <clears throat> and it said, he, he mentioned about his heart. And he mentioned about having a root of bitterness springing up. And I'm going to read that to you. Hebrews 12, verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby, thereby many be defiled. And the thing is, is we're going to be hurt by others. We're going to be hurt by family. We're going to be hurt by friends. We're going to be hurt by church members. People that we say that shouldn't happen. Uh, don't let bitterness get at you. Keep your heart tender towards God. God didn't do it. Okay. Now, maybe there's times God authorized and allowed the things to take place, which he obviously does. But keep our heart tender towards God. We need a tough hide toward man, but we need a tender heart towards God. Now, if our critic throws some critical words at us, a man with a tender heart will even consider those words. What if the critic is seeing our blind spot? And what if he honked at us when we're trying to scoot to the next lane and he saved us from an accident? Instead of getting mad at him for honking at us, thank him for saving us from an accident. And sometimes our critics can point out our blind spots and that's good for us. So it's not good for them. Well, that's their problem. Keep a tender heart. I mean, when David was mocked and ridiculed by Shimei, one of his men said, hey, let me kill the guy. I can take him out. Just like, man, I can take him out. He said, no, maybe the Lord's using him to speak to me. David had a tender heart. Oh, yeah, he caused some mess. He caused some mess. But he had a tender heart. In this age of all the spiritual warfare that we need to know about and all the stuff that's going on and the bombardment that you and I are getting, men on the job, women on the job, you know, you go to the store, you got the music being blared at you, the media's got this stuff being thrown at our way, and we need to keep our heart tender towards God. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. When you get attitude of depression... Discouragement, lethargy, path, uh, passivity. Get alone with God and let him tenderize your heart. Okay, those are all effects where a spirit has gotten to a person. And we can get, you know, get to be a zombie. You know, I don't like that idea. Don't even like that word. Don't even like, you know, the idea. But most Americans are acting like zombies. You know, come down to Purdue and watch him walk by. You say, hi, how you doing? What are you, deaf? 
you know, at least acknowledge somebody. People will say, well, a lot of street preaching is not done right. And a lot of preaching is not done right. So do it right. If nobody gets the benefit of my street preaching, I get a great benefit out of it. Because it knocks down my flesh. And I'll get some arguments that I never thought of before. And then I go to my God, and that drives me to the God, and he helps me study more. Okay, and that's diligence. But keep thy heart with all diligence. Diligence with vigilance, keeping a sincere and pure heart. And the last idea is, if you would, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 29. Diligence in knowing the end of a thing. Uh, Solomon said, the end of a thing is better than the beginning. Okay, so the idea is, it's not how you start the marathon that's important. It's how you end. And it's not how you start life that's important. It's how you end. Okay, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 29. I'm sorry, 32, 29. The Lord, he's wishing. Oh, I just wish this would happen. He said, oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, and that they would consider their latter end. Oh, if they would just think long term. How is this action going to turn out long term? You see, the end of the wicked. What is the end of the wicked? It's terrible. It's a bad ending. It's a bad ending. Okay? Oh, you know, pretty boy Floyd, you know, he made a hundred million bucks last night. But if he keeps going down that road, it's got a bad ending. It's not worth it. Bad, bad ending. I mean, I've seen uh, what fire does in a physical body. My brother, when he was five years old, got burned from here down. I mean, as he grew, he had to get skin grafts because the skin graft doesn't stretch and doesn't grow. I mean, just recently, if you look at his thigh, he's got like a two by eight inch patch here, one here and one here. And the skin grafting is man, almost worse than where they had to put it. And they try to put an open wound down here. I've seen what physical fire does to the physical body. Brother Nolan can tell you about his experience lately, what the physical fire does to a physical body. How about a spiritual fire, what it does to a spiritual body? There's no skin grafting down there. And the end of the wicked, they better enjoy it now. You know, the health club people that, you know, ignoring the Bible and trying to extend their life, they better enjoy it as long as they can. Try to put off that judgment as long as they can. If they pick up their Bible, it'd be a lot better ending. I mean... In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 1, a guy sits down at a charity political dinner and paid 1500 bucks for a T-bone steak just to allow some politician to get in office. And it says in Proverbs 23, verse 1, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what's before thee. What's in front of you? Somebody that would most likely sell their own mother out for a nickel. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's the attitude. You say, what side of the aisle? Both. It doesn't matter. Consider what's in front of you. And then he says, and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. You see, diligently know the end of the wicked. Diligently know the end of good. What's the end of righteous life? Hebrews 6, verse 10, he says, He will not forget the labor of love. Isn't that a blessing to know that? A lot of times we talk about reaping and sowing, we usually are on the negative side. Our God in heaven will not forget your labor of love. Nobody may have seen it. Maybe you did it in secret. God is keeping those accounts. He's just marking them down. And he will not forget those labors of love. Man, I don't know about you, that excites me. You see, and when you offer somebody a gospel track and they reject it, God has just thrown another reward. You say, well, they didn't take the track. It doesn't matter, it's a different award. Either way, it's a blessing. 
you get out of that. God will not forget our labor of love. And we need to diligently think about the end and know that when I stand in front of my God, oh, by His grace, possibly we could hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Don't know if it's going to happen, but just the thought of hopefully hearing that would be a wonderful thing. And these are things we're diligent at. Diligence is something that's got to well up in your heart individually and for you to hunger and thirst after righteousness no matter what anybody else does. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to be diligent people <coughs> knowing that you will reward reward those who are diligent in seeking after thee. And you will reward those who are diligently adding virtue to their faith and charity and temperance to our faith. Where each and every one of us diligently seek after this and help us diligently to seek after your words. And help us to diligently be faithful until we see you face to face. And Lord, we're looking forward to that day. And as you pray, you'd help all of us to within our hearts to realize that the responsibility is ours to diligently seek after your truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed with that.